I want to tell you how I met Christina. We met 2020 in the spring, right before COVID hit. I was in Arizona, excuse me, yeah, Arizona, in a prison there, and also got to speak at an event at a fundraiser for one of the prison ministries called Rescue Not Arrested. And so Christina's story, much like you saw Rodney's story tonight, hers was the highlighted story that night. And when I heard her story, I was so moved, and I went and called her after the event. I'm like tapping her on the shoulder. I think the magazine I gave her had mustard or something all over it. And I gave her my number, and I said, I would love to share your story in our magazine. Pray about it. And so she connected with Mr. Pat, and our paths crossed. Little did we know that we would be in a relationship like we are, and I'll let her tell you about that. But before, I would just love for you to hear Christina's story. And so we're going to take a little walk with some photos that are up on the screen for you to see. And this is little Christina with the cute little bangs. Uh -oh, tell us a little bit about this young lady here. So in this picture, I'm 10 years old. I'm in the fifth grade. And... Um, this picture is significant for a couple of reasons. The first one was um, that a uh, professor from the University of Arizona School of Journalism had come to my school. She had done a writing exercise and uh, she had taken them home and contacted my fifth grade teacher a few weeks later and said, uh, she went, who is this kid? I want to get to know who this kid is. Um, she's got great writing skills. And uh, long story short, she came and she picked me up and she took me on a personal tour to the University of Arizona. I sat in a professor's lecture. I went to the Arizona Daily Star, which is the local newspaper there, and I met journalists and reporters. And this lady was telling everybody, Christina is going to be a writer someday. And um, so, you know, that, that was a dream that was planted in my heart because it was one of the first times in my childhood that I felt seen or heard by anybody. Um, the other reason that this picture is significant, I was 10 years old, but by 10 years old, I had learned to wear a lot of masks and to conceal a lot of what was going on in my, my personal life and in my home life um, because by the age of 10, I had endured um, sexual trauma and abuse and I had, uh, I was an only child, and, and unfortunately my, my biological father had been killed in a uh, drunk driving accident. So um, he, he had left my mother a widow, and my mother remarried with somebody that didn't like or want children. And so that kind of left me in a, in a vulnerable situation. So uh, a lot of things that my, my, my heart and my mind were unable to process at the age of 10, 10 years old had already happened at that age. Um, three years after that picture was taken, um, I left home and I have been on my own ever since, since the age of 13. So that was what was significant about that picture. Well, a lot of time happened from this picture to the next picture. And we're gonna talk about the journey of that. But David, if you'll go ahead, this is, um, 2000 and this is 2015 so in 2015 I um, was arrested and on uh, August of 2015 is when that picture was taken um, so that is about a little over 30 years of heroin addiction um, life on the streets life homeless um, just you know uh, I wasn't responsible for the things that I that had happened to me as a child. I was unable to process those those things, um, and it kind of set me on a collision course with the world. And um, so I spent the majority of my life not knowing about Jesus and not understanding that He had created me on purpose with a totally different purpose than what the direction of my life had taken. Um, so. By the time 2015 had rolled around, the enemy had pretty much chewed me up and spit me out, and um, I was—I just wanted to die. That was the only thing that, that I was praying for at that point in time was to stop breathing. If, if, if you exist, God, could you just please make me stop breathing? So I was in jail. Um, about uh, three days after that picture was taken, uh, the heroin withdrawals had sunk in, and um, I was on the floor of a jail, jail cell, and um, that, that's where my relationship and my story with the Lord began to unfold in jail. 
if I remember correctly, you had a bunkie, a bunk mate. Yeah, so I went through the heroin withdrawals on Suicide Watch, um, and then as I came out of Suicide Watch and got put into general population, the Lord had gone ahead of me and prepared the way and put me in a two-man cell with a woman who wanted to do absolutely nothing but talk about Jesus. <laughs> and I, I was just, I mean, I was still, you know, really going through heroin withdrawals really, really bad, but I was on the top bunk and there was nowhere to go, and I just could not get away from this lady that wanted to talk about Jesus. And so, um, you know, she just, she just read me scriptures, and she told me the story of Joseph, and she told me about what the enemy had intended to harm Joseph, God turned around and used for good to help many people and just all these different things. And and uh, little by little, in this cell with nothing but this lady that would not stop talking about the Lord, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I had no idea what that even meant, but all I knew was that I could not carry on and continue in the way that I was living. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today, um, but for Jesus Christ and but for the gospel. And because I heard that in jail, prison ministry is very significant to me um, because there's a million me's like that right there. That um, but for the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. There's 2.2 million me's as you just said that are incarcerated right this minute, and another 10 to 12 million who are circulating in and out of jail every single year. And so we have an opportunity to extend a hand of hope. This is the cover that just came in yesterday, or two days ago, I'm very excited, it's hot off the press. And this picture, you were telling me, Christina, that this picture means so much to you. It's the hand of Jesus reaching into the water to pick up Peter, who had sunk. And this, the Lord had put on my heart to write the story of Jesus in first person. I'm like, how do you come and speak Jesus' voice? And how do you get Jesus to sit for a photo shoot to put on the cover? Um, and so we came across this photography, this art, by a North Korean man, and he gave us permission to use this. And you saw this picture, and you said, I love it, because this is what happened to me when I was drowning in darkness. So when I was in uh, on the floor of the jail, in uh, county jail, um, and I was going through the heroin withdrawals, you know, I cried out to God. I don't, I don't even know if you exist. I don't, I don't know if you're real, but if you do, please just either make me stop breathing or help me because I cannot go on like this anymore. And um, so as I came out of that and, and I began to regain my strength, you know, I, I got the word of God in my hands and this scripture came into my life and the Lord spoke into my heart very quickly. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And the spacious place that he happened to bring me into to save my life was prison. So, so let's put this next picture up. This beauty queen, <laughs> where is she located right now in that picture? So in that picture, um, so that was December of 2017. So I had just done about two and a half years in prison. Um, and I had spent two and a half years of my life in this Bible. And the Lord just continued to put his word into my heart. And um, little by little by little, the transformation, the new creation in Christ that we, we hear and we talk about. I mean, like, it's, it's like I was a, a, you know, a worm that goes into a cocoon. I was in prison for two and a half years and I emerged this whole other person um, and my, my life scripture um, is Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And I did not realize that I would be called to this purpose here today at that point in time, but I knew I was getting ready to be released, and I knew that I was committed to follow the Lord wherever he would lead me. And um, so that's... Uh, 
how I looked in 2017, just about a one week before my release. So you were released, and the first thing you did was contacted, it's probably not the first, but one of the first things is you contacted this ministry, Rescue Not Arrested, because this is the Bible that she got, and this is one of our partners also. So anyone who wants a Bible is able to connect, they're able to connect with our partner, Roger Munchian, Rescue Not Arrested, and they get this free study Bible in English and in Spanish. And he is one of the top prison providers in prisons across the United States. And 30%, he said, of his um, distribution comes through relationships with our magazine. Yes. So that's very exciting. But you went to work for him. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I did what Carla does for Victorious Living Magazine at the time. I got to um, open all the letters from Rescued Not Arrested. And I actually had the privilege of packaging up the Word of God and sending it into the prisons. Um, <coughs> You know, the, the way that somebody had done for me to put the gospel um, into their hands and, and it, the way it changed my life, I got to be a part of that. Um, I had no idea that the, the Lord was laying the groundwork in just my being obedient to Him and showing up to, to package these Bibles that uh, two and a half years later after serving with that ministry that my, my life and my path would intersect with Christy and then there's more. Oh, wait, there's more. So here's the last picture. Tell me about this girl. <clears throat> so um, I'm the production manager for Victorious Living Magazine, and um, I, I have to tell you that that is uh, something that only God could have orchestrated. And when I say um, that he, he uses all things and he works all things together for good, um, I, ha I have to add here that I don't even have a, I don't have a college education. Um, I don't, I got my GED when I, when I was in prison for the first time in 1991. I've been to prison three times. Um, but that scripture, and he works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, there's like no resume qualification for that. Mm -hmm. And so he calls all of us from all walks of life into various programs like this and ministries like this so that we can, you know, come together and bring our experience and, and um, our testimonies because, um, you know, we defeat the enemy by the word of the, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so, you know, we have people who write stories for Victorious Living that have never, ever seen the inside of a prison. And then we have people that write stories for Victorious Living that um, will never see the light of day again. And so, um, ultimately, the, the, the role and the goal of this ministry is to make sure that the gospel, which has the power to save our souls, is put into the hands of every single person that wants it. And, and, it, and, and once that happens, the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest as he did in my life. So we have one thing I want her to share, and then I will let her go have a brownie or cookie if you didn't eat it yet. And... Um, she has a personal testimony of how she knows that the magazine is making a difference. Her daughter is incarcerated, or at the time was incarcerated, and called you and said, Mama, did you know that you're in this magazine? And so her daughter got the magazine, read her mother's story, who her mother had been trying to share Jesus with her many, many, many times, and didn't really want to hear it. But when she was silent in that prison or in that jail, she got victorious living, read her mother's story, and said, Mama, can you send me one of those Bibles that you read? Can you send more magazines for my friends that are here? And so her daughter gets out, and um, a little while later, like many people do, 85 plus percent of people recidivate, which means they go back to prison. But if they get connected to the Lord and they get connected to jobs and they get connected to churches, less than 10%, I think it's 8% or less, return back to prison. So her daughter returned back to prison and her daughter wrote her a letter. And I want her to close with this. A year later, um, my daughter, you know, was back in jail and she wrote me this letter. She said, um, honestly, mom, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have you in my life right now. 
you just coming back into my life after doing a complete transformation of yourself and moving nowhere but for but forward in your life in all areas it really gives me hope and not just me a lot of women that got a chance to read your story have sat down and talked to me from since back when I was here from February, July 2020, that magazine still floats around. And they all tell me how lucky I am to have you and how much you inspire them or how much they can relate to your story. Many have sat down with me and asked me about my life and our story and I can say that many of them got emotional because they began to lose hope with repairing a child, children and mother relationship whether it was alcohol, drugs, the game, whatever. But with pride, I let them know that it's all because of God. God and complete faith and trust made this possible. So with that being said, Mom, you made such an amazing impact on my life and you've opened my, mind, my eyes to many new possibilities that could become of my life for the better. And she goes on to say that um, she's not sure, you know, how that's going to unfold. But I have to say that um, as much as, you know, generational patterns and generational things that our children go through because of the choices that we've made, Jesus' healing and transformative power is also generational. And so my daughter, no matter what she goes through, I will hold tight and cling to the truth of the gospel that changed my life. She has had a seed planted that magazine, a year later, one single magazine is still floating around um, a facility that my daughter was in and as she circles back through there, however many times it takes in her lifetime, people are gonna come up and remind her, hey, you know, your mom gave her life to Jesus and changed everything, so hopefully, not hopefully, that's gonna be my daughter's story as well. This is one of my favorite stories, a little girl, who had a dream to be a writer. 30 years in prison, heroin addiction, thought that would never happen. But God intervened, intersected, and now she's writing stories, interviewing people, writing their stories, and keeping me on task, yeah. which is no easy task. No. <laughs> <laughs> to be part of this um, part of this ministry and I um, every moment of my life whether it's my involvement with this ministry or, or otherwise I don't take for granted um, it, everything is very surreal and uh, I'm just very very grateful to Jesus and I can't emphasize enough how imperative it is that we get the gospel and, and that kind of hope into the hands of as many people behind bars as possible. Thank you. Thank you.